Okay, so we're going to present in chronological order of our subject matter. So first we have uh, Sonia Hernandez, who is a Chan Chancellor Edges Fellow and Associate Professor of History at Texas A&M University. Um, she's published multiple books, including one called Working Women into the Borderlands in 2014, and has a forthcoming book called For a Just and Better World, Engendering Anarchism in the Mexican Borderlands, 1900 to 1938, which I'm very excited to read, um, which examines a transnational network of labor activists sustained by anarcho-feminists like Caritina Pina based in the port of Tampico. So Sonia, thanks so much again for, for being here and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Spencer, and greetings from College Station, Texas. Um, thank you all for being here and joining us on this Sunday uh, afternoon. I may still sound a little groggy and a little hoarse because I am actually recovering from, from strep throat. Um, so apologies on that. And then just, just um, being my, my sleepy, lazy self uh, on this Sunday um, afternoon. Uh, and by the way, uh, my, my forthcoming book is no longer forthcoming. It is here. So thank you for the plug-in, Spencer. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a small part of um, what I examine in For a Just and Better World, published by the University of Illinois Press. Um, and while it is, um, it is a narrative, it is a story that takes place in Northeastern Mexico in the Gulf of Mexico port of Tampico, it, uh, this, this uh, larger you know, history um, and larger activism on the part of Mexicanas and Mexicanos, uh, uh, all of these things had implications for, um, for the US context. And so this, uh, this story takes place in the port of Tampico. Uh, and in context is important here because the port of Tampico about, um, oh, about 500 miles from uh, the border town of Brownsville, Texas, um, uh, and just across Matamoros, Tamaulipas. Um, uh, context matters because Tampico emerges as a major oil producing site uh, that attracts corporations uh, from the US, from uh, Great Britain and other places. Uh, at the invitation of the Mexican government. So early on in Tampico, there is a critique that emerges about the role of US capital and other foreign capital in um, changing uh, the environment, the work environment, and the just the regular you know, communities uh, of of the people, uh, in this case, in Tampico and the vicinity. The other important thing to point out is that even before, um, so I start, I start this, uh, this, this book in 1900, but even before 1900, certainly by the mid 19th century, there's already a long tradition of mutual aid societies, of mutualismo, of uh, reciprocal forms of community, community life um, that had developed since you know, the pre-industrial uh, period, um, drawing and, and building upon a long indigenous tradition in the region that is considered the Huasteca region, right in the outskirts of the port of Tampico. <clears throat> and so it is a place uh, that locally speaking is sort of ripe for the, uh, you know, the embracing of uh, imported ideas uh, that would really mesh very well with localized, localized ideas about community autonomy, uh, village or pueblo autonomy um, that just uh, really, you know, sort of, uh, uh, embrace uh, anarchist and 
eventually anarcho-syndicalist ideas very, very nicely by the turn of the 20th century. Uh, there are all kinds of people moving to the port of Tampico because of employment opportunities, principally the oil sector, but um, related sectors like dock uh, work, the hotel and restaurant business, all kinds of things are happening in Tampico. And so there are people from, from Greece, from Russia, from Great Britain, from the United States, but certainly also people coming from the countryside and other more mature urban centers like Mexico City. And it is, uh, it's, it's one woman uh, who uh, then decides to make the move to Tampico from uh, the urban center of Mexico City, originally for, from the border state of, of Chihuahua, uh, and her name was Reynalda Gonzalez Parra. Uh, and Reynalda Gonzalez Parra from Casas Grandes, uh, again, from the border state of Chihuahua, um, uh, eventually moves to Mexico City and becomes involved with uh, what would soon become the Casa del Obrero Mundial or the House of the Global Worker. The Casa del Obrero Mundial, the COM, um, uh, if we use the acronym, the COM, founded in 1912, but already with the ideas about um, worker autonomy, um, mutual reciprocity, as early as you know, the, the, the first years of the 20th century, um, this is all happening in Mexico City and Reynalda Gonzalez Parra becomes involved in uh, this movement that began to critique um, changes in society having to do with the introduction of industrialization, right? Um, and so these ideas that were circulating in, in the region, coming from abroad, but then sort of mixing with localized in, uh, ideas about worker autonomy, about um, the a dignified way of life. That is a term that keeps popping up in the literature, the term dignidad or dignity. And so all these things really appeal to folks who are living that change, right? That are being introduced to a new work environment, clocking in, clocking out with the, you know, emergence of textile factories, cigarreras, or the, the, the cigar rolling establishments, right? All sort of different types of industrial sectors sort of tied to this larger vision um, promoted by the Mexican government, princ principally um, by uh, general dictator, um, and to some people, President uh, Porfirio Diaz, who had um, promoted this vision of uh, a, a developed Mexico, a modernized Mexico, really looking at European countries and the United States for sort of to adopt those models and begins to uh, encourage foreign investment. And I mean, to the point where, you know, the Diaz administration was offering like these crazy incentives, like 99 year tax concessions. That, um, the, the, that one of the major problems, right? There were several problems with that model, but one of the problems was that um, these corporations were not giving back to the communities. And so there's sort of this gross discrepancy uh, in terms of, you know, who had access to, uh, to the benefits that were being, you know, touted as, right, these are modern benefits, right, this is why uh, we should, um, we should uh, promote industrialization. Well, not everybody was privy to those kinds of things. Um, and it's um, uh, Reynalda Gonzalez Parra, and, and let me just share my screen really quickly here so you can see an image of her. Um, uh, give me just a second here. As you can see, I don't have uh, many images here. Let me just uh, move my little uh, gallery box here so that I can see my screen. Can everyone see that? Okay, and it's, it's the, the image on the left. Unfortunately, we don't have an image of Reynalda Gonzalez Parra um, by herself. Uh, but here, this is, a, this is a pretty powerful image because you can see um, that Reynalda Gonzalez Parra is a lone woman here in this 1917 
image of the second Workers Congress that took place in Tampico in the border state of Tamaulipas. And now she was not the only female attendee, but she was the only female delegate. And she's representing some 16, 17 organizations from the port of Tampico. Um, and so um, she uh, plays an instrumental role in not only promoting the ideas of the COM, of the, of the Casa del Obrero Mundial, the House of the Global Worker, but also promotes through that vehicle, she promotes the ideas of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World. There was a branch in Mexico City and there was already a branch even before she moved to, to uh, Tampico in 1917. Even before that, there was an IWW branch uh, uh, closely linked to the Maritime Workers Union there in the port of Tampico. Uh, now, she also um, helped to promote other local organizations like the Red Brothers or Hermanos Rojos, uh, founded in 1917, but pretty active even before 1917. There were members, again, that reflected sort of this cosmopolitan characteristic of the Port of Tampico. There were folks from Spain, there were folks from the US, there were folks from, uh, from Greece, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Italy, um, and uh, you know, collaborated quite closely with a lot of the Mexicanos from other urban centers like Reynaldo Gonzalez Parra, but also from the countryside um, soon we would have uh, the migration of Caritina Piña from the countryside of the border state of Tamaulipas, uh, thanks to um, sort of the pioneer work that Reynaldo Gonzalez Parra uh, did. And so if very early on, like this may seem sort of like a Mexican narrative or a Mexican story, but it's very much sort of grounded in this larger uh, U.S. Mexico capitalist critique that um, that was applied that that was um, used by the Diaz Porfirio Diaz regime to promote industrialization. Really, sort of using American and foreign capital, but using Mexican labor. Right. Um, so this really appeals to people who are sort of experiencing these changes, and certainly women too. Right, there is a more conspicuous presence of women in wage labor. This is not like, um, this is not to say that women uh, only began to work when industrialization uh, began in earnest in Mexico. They had worked for wages before, um, uh, but um, there's a much more uh, conspicuous presence, there's a heavier presence uh, on the part of women in various sectors like textiles, cigarreras, you know, the cigar rolling establishments, and in commercial farms, certainly commercial farms across the state of Tamaulipas. And so early on, Reynaldo Gonzalez Parra, through the very small but very active and very influential anarchist press, anchored in Tampico, but with connections across the Atlantic, connections certainly across Texas to South Texas and points beyond, begins to sort of develop what, would, what we could call sort of like an early feminist discourse that used the idea of motherhood, of like maternal politics, but like politicized that and used motherhood not to um, serve the interests of the Mexican state because that discourse was already being sort of, was our, already circulating um, used by the revolutionary government um, of Venustiano Carranza, who eventually uh, would emerge as the president of Mexico following Madero with the ousting of Diaz as these um, uh, anarchist uh, collectives, anarcho syndicalists, and also communist uh, collectives sort of uh, began to, um, to pressure um, um, and advance a critique about um, uh, Diaz's uh, policies. Um, so, so early on, we have in the Port of Tampico through Reynaldo Gonzalez Parra, this sort of early discourse um, of what we could call sort of like a revolutionary motherhood, right? That, that, that 
um, spoke directly to madres obreras or working mothers, right? That, I mean, this was uh, something that really appealed to them. And, and, and in the North, I think it's really important to point out that in, in the Mexican North and certainly in the border state of Tamaulipas, we don't see this, um, this discourse to sort of um, uh, prohibit women from, uh, from taking on wage labor, like, uh, like you know, that discourse circulated in other parts of Mexico. And it, it's, it, do, it, it doesn't happen in the Mexican North because there was always a labor shortage and there's always sort of labor scarcity to the point where the wages tended to be higher in Northern Mexico compared to Southern Mexico. Um, because of the proximity to Texas. So there's always a fear on the part of industrialists, on the part of commercial, uh, commercial farm management that people will cross into Texas and other places for higher wages, right? And so, um, so that doesn't happen with respect to women uh, in the Mexican North. And so there, uh, there are women workers all over the place in the North. Um, and uh, so the, the rhetoric and the potential to affect change that anar anar anarchism and that eventually anarcho anarcho syndicalism or putting those anarchist more more um, abstract ideas to work through unions right uh, in the form of anarcho syndicalism or anarcho syndicalismo uh, that becomes really popular and that that really appeals to a lot of these madres obreras these working mothers um and so, 15 minute uh, warning, Sonia. Sorry? It's your 15 minute warning. Oh, my goodness, really. And I have like three more pages of notes here. Um, thank you, Spencer. Well, um, all this to say that, you know, I can talk about other pioneer women, but this really is key uh, for like a, a greater opening of. Uh, for, for women to express their concerns and their ideas and really join the labor movement. Uh, in, in this case, my concern is um, the labor movement um, uh, in the form of anarcho-syndicalism, which emerges as one of the most radical forms of labor activism in this corner of the globe. Um, and there's other forms as well, right? But um, so it's other women like Caritina Piña um, uh, the image here on the right that open up uh, that open up the, um, the this, um, this this road for a more robust participation on the part of women. Caritina Piña comes from a revolutionary family. She's from the countryside of of Tamaulipas. Um, her father um, was a uh, revolutionary general. Her half brother was an alzado or a rebelde or a rebel. Um, uh, fighting on behalf of the Magonistas. Her father um, ironically fought for the Venustiano Carranza revolutionary faction. And it's Carranza uh, that emerges as um, this sort of, you know, traitor to the revolution because he begins by 1917, he begins to crack down on the most radical voices of the labor of the labor movement, anarchists and communists, but for the most part, anarchists. And then there's another sort of wave of repression really targeting communists by, um, by the, the latter part of the Mexican revolution, certainly by 1919, 1920. And, and so, uh, you know, this is like in the midst, these women are actively trying to affect change and encourage other women to join the labor movement in the midst of a crackdown. Carranza is imprisoning uh, the, the most radical of, of, uh, of voices, including lots of folks who were tied to the Casa del Obrero Mundial and the IWW. And certainly um, uh, this would continue even after Carranza. So it continues under the regime of Emilio Portes, who becomes governor of Tamaulipas. And that directly affects Caritina Piña, because Caritina Piña begins to um, collaborate with Esteban Mendez Guerra. Esteban Mendez Guerra here, who appears in an image uh, brutally tortured um, um, uh, at the hands of a general uh, ordered by the governor, Emilio Portes Hill. Um, and so Piña uh, collaborates with Mendez Guerra, who had been a former Villista, had fought for the Mexican Revolution, retired after the revolution, organizes an anarcho-syndicalist collective, and Caritina Piña joins that collective and joins as the secretary of correspondence. So she's, 
She's in charge of propaganda. She knows about the emergence of new groups. She sends, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, newspaper clippings of, you know, major anarchist newspapers in the region across the border and across the Atlantic Ocean, all in the midst of a sort of second wave of rep repression at the, ha at the hands of the media porpoise regime. Um, torturing uh, some of the most radical voices. And let me point out that Emilio Portesi in Mexican historiography is seen as a champion of labor rights. Now, he promotes the idea of cross-class cooperation and founds his PSF, the Partido Socialista Fronterizo, the Socialist Border Party. But he does so through state-sanctioned socialism. And it's a socialism that's safe for the state and so his administration sort of is very selective and labor activism is allowed, but it's only when it's good or of, it works in the interests of the government. And this, uh, dear audience, this sort of lays the foundation for the pre, the, the current um, uh, viable political party in Mexico today. It's not, it's not, um, yeah, it's not in, in sort of the majority right now, but that this sort of lays the foundation for the next several um, decades, the PRI would be in power. That would be the, the government of the revolution, right? Always use the memory of the revolution, but very selective. It silenced anarchist voices and it silenced communist voices and it only basically allowed room for uh, those labor activists sort of um, that were cooperating with, with a political party. So in short, to end this talk, Labor, organized labor becomes co-opted. And so by 1931, as the federal labor law becomes codified in the Ley Federal del Trabajo in 1931, you know, direct action and those forms of sort of anarchist expressions on behalf of the working class sort of become irrelevant because the state becomes the arbiter through the labor boards. And so now, you know, workers can organize unions and they can engage in strikes, but it's all sort of through um, through kind of like, you know, the safe politics of the state. Uh, and it's all to the detriment of the anarchists because, you know, you know, they, they've sort of become silent. However, it's important to point out that the legacy of anarcho-syndicalism and of anarcho-expression uh, and certainly anarcho-feminism lives on, right? In the form of direct action, in the form of direct petitioning, uh, in, in, on behalf of political prisoners, and uh, which still happens to this day, unfortunately, in, in places like Mexico. But um, so uh, at the end, while there was a, you know, two waves of repression against uh, anarchist voices like Piña, like Reynalda González Parras and, and Mendes Guerra, um, that legacy uh, continues and it is still uh, pretty, pretty visible today in, in the Mexican countryside. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sonia. That was a really fascinating uh, history and look forward to the discussion. Um, uh, next on our panel is Monse Feu, who recovers and examines the literary history of the Spanish Civil War exile in the United States. Um, U.S. Hispanic periodicals and migration and exile literature at large. Um, she's the author of multiple books, most recently Fighting Fascist Spain, Worker Protests from the Printing Press. And she's also co-editor of Writing Revolution, Hispanic Anarchism in the United States. So thanks so much, Monse, and take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers of the book fair and to Spencer for the invitation. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to see us. Uh, I hope we inspire you with the recovery of uh, this anarcha-syndicalist, um, anarcha anarcha-feminist. Um, just recently, uh, Spencer invited me to, to talk about um, US Hispanic women uh, fighting fascism and also their anarchist and cultural uh, politics. And this is actually in my website and in the YouTube that I maintain all this information. I'm doing a, a digital project to be able so that all these um, 
primary sources are preserved. So I invite you to look at that. As you see on, in the book, also I discussed this in the previous, uh, in the last year it came out and I also discussed how they fought fascism from the United States. They usually did a lot of direct action. So what they did is they um, do um, fundraisers to support prisoners, to support uh, refugees, exiles. These were uh, Hispanas Confederadas, Las Sociedades. This was like about 200 societies. This is not exiles. This is private, previous migrants. This is in coalition with other progressives. So we have anarchists, socialists, progressive and um, not only Hispanics, there were all sorts of people that want to fight fascism and join. So they would do um, um, educational practices, they would do anti-fascist plays, conferences, dances, anything that would collect money. They would also go and picket um, um, pro-fascist um, um, businesses. Uh, in all the United States, so letting people know they were buying fascist products. They also did demonstrations on the streets. And this is a picture of 2000 on them in Washington, DC. This is not one instance, this is from the 30s to the 70s. So it's a thousand and thousand of events like this. So this didn't stop in 45, this continued. So there is this huge um, archive that I'm recovering so that we can learn from them. Um, I just put this um, uh, um, kind of, the, I'm talking about the Spanish fascism in their periodicals and then direct action. They also boycotted other fascist products, but basically it was a Spanish fascism. So you may know, I'm sure that Spain had two progressive republics, but uh, the Francisco Franco and other military uprising um, brought the fascist war. I like to call it fascist war. I know it's been called civil, civil Spanish war. This is because of the legacy of the, um, differently from um, Germany and other countries, we had, you know, a Cold War negative that presented Franco as a defendant of Catholicism and communism so that we could have US, Spanish, uh, US bases in Spain. Also, the Spanish transition had an, an amnesty law that didn't um, have any, um, um, any of the fascists put to uh, trial. So this is why there is a lot of ways of talking about this war and about this dictatorship that I like to call it fascist Spain. Um, today, I thought it would be nice because I talked about this direct action in that um, talk that you can watch at any time. Uh, I, I thought it would be better to focus on the writing so that we share their voices and we hear them talk. Uh, one of the people I wanted to focus today I'm writing about and doing also an exhibit, a digital exhibit in the Arte Publico Press digital collections is Violeta Michele, um, Michele Mayo de Gonzalez. I chose her because it's very difficult to find their voices but in their periodicals, you find their writings, and she exemplifies a lot of the anarcha feminists that were in these societies that I talk uh, to you about. They were all about the United States. She was born in Key West. She was the daughter of cigar uh, rollers in Florida. They were Cuban, but their grandparents escaped Spain. So um, she. Um, started to, she, she was a teacher, but very soon she started to write for periodicals. She write in periodicals in New York, Key West, of course, New York, in Mexico, in Valencia, in Spain, and Buenos Aires. She wrote about feminism, education. She wrote about the humanities, the Hispanic societies in the United States and what they were doing. And today I will focus more on her anti-fascist writing. In this uh, article in Cultura Proletaria, this was a periodical in New York, it was an arco uh, periodical in New York. She writes an article in defense of this periodical. And you can see that she was an executive member of the board of the group that was uh, doing this periodical. 
She was also part of a committee that was reaching to other anarchists. Usually they reached to Hispanic anarchists, but in these groups, there were a mixture, as, as my colleague has said, there were a mixture of Italian, Anglo-Americans. I mean, everybody joined usually because they live close by or they were friends with somebody or they were doing anti-fascist plays with them or they were doing anarcho plays with them. So it does, it's not a limit by ethnic limits you don't see that in these groups, but most of them were um, Hispanic. I use the, the term Hispanic because there was people from Spain, previous migrants and people from the Americas. So then you can see also that she was part of this community that was reaching out to all the anarchists of the United States to make a confederation of anarchists. She was also a secretary that was uh, working on promoting teachings and conferences on they have a Centro de Estudios Sociales. This uh, centro, it was where you would learn as a worker. She was teaching Spanish to the kids of workers because the United States has been very bad at preserving their linguistic and cultural diversity. So she was very aware of that. And that's why she went at night to teach children so they could write in Spanish. She was very popular, and uh, we know that because in most of the articles is in the front page of periodicals, but also in Despertar, that was this other anarchist periodical in Key West, there was a petition that her article, Marcha Ascendente, is like a, a you know, forward, moving forward um, article was reprinted. And this article that I'm trying, I'm going to put in the, um, in the digital uh, exhibit, is a call of action to workers because they, she tells them, if you come to our centers and you get educated and you come to join us and you have this freedom association we have here in the United States, these are your best weapons to do our anarchist ideal. In terms of anti-fascism, we see that very early she started to write on the 30s and also on the 40s, but in the 30s on, on the, I think I missed that one, okay, sorry about that. But I will tell you, in the 30s and in the 40s, she started writing about how um, Italy is helping Spain. And to do that, she cites Il Popolo, that is the Italian newspaper, and she says, don't believe me, believe, me, believe this fascist periodical that is talking about how they are, are helping Spain. And then she also quotes, she was an avid reader. She also quotes um, periodicals in, in Britain and in the Franco zone that were saying how the British were helping uh, Franco to succeed in the war. And she concludes the article saying that this quote, so she was a, an active researcher. She says, this quote that I show you is a magnificent example of what patriotism means for bankers, the aristocracy, the privilege, namely international military cooperation with the Nazi fascism to exterminate the European workers' hopes. In a call for action in España Libre, she called all the women to boycott the fascist products. And she asked them again with this motherhood, this, this, uh, this radical, this revolutionary motherhood, right? Uh, we have to understand these very patriarchal periodicals. So sometimes this was the way to get published. So if you appeal to caring for the children as a woman, you appealed as your motherhood, you appealed as helping you know, refugees, you were able to participate. So that's where the ways for women to participate. So she says Spanish, Czechoslovakian, Polish and Finnish mothers, all mothers who have suffered the horrors of seeing their children torn apart by the bullets of Hitler, Mussolini, Franco and Stel, Stalin says, go to the streets and boycott all these businesses. And then she says, remember that as women, you can do a lot of good when you accept your responsibility of our destiny and the vanguard of the people. So they were feeling like the people that were changing the world, like the title of Sonia's book, like a new world, a, fake, a more um, just world. These calls of action were very important. In my book and my digital exhibits, I, we now historically can see the exporters, uh, the shop owners, the performers that were helping Franco during the war and after the war to fascist Spain. So uh, they have helped us see 
who was helping Franco and then the Franco dictatorship. So this was important at that moment, but also historically. Also, she always um, get back to people who, you know, she was an avid reader and she read uh, Jacob Siegel, he was the director of the Jewish Daily Forward. So you see, she was reading mainstream press, anarchist press, and she was upset because she, um, uh, the director talked about Emma Goldman and that she would be awesome in fighting fascism. And she replies to him and says, what are you talking about? She, she has already been a warrior against fascism. She was in Spain. She was lecturing through Europe. And uh, so she says, when you want to um, recognize the work of women, instead of saying what they could have done, please tell what they have already done because we have done so much. And she says, um, to an anarchist who did her revolutionary deed, she's talking about Emma, there's always this call for actions, always at the end of her articles that she did her revolutionary deed. So she's very upset of the misrepresentation of what she did. Says, make sure readers that we follow, right? Let me move my screen so I can read. <laughs> I can read it, sorry. So that we follow the, the lead and demonstrate our love to her. Remembering her writing, we will never forget her. So I learned a lot from Michele. So that's what I, today I wanted to read Michele. So that as she asked people to read Emma, I asked today people to read Michele, right? So that's why she inspired me to change um, my presentation today, right? Obviously, she said that fascism was not enough and the state had to be um, also uh, contested. That was in Cultura Proletaria. She said both the state and fascism were oppressing workers. And now I have to move it because I won't be able to. So she says, uh, workers who had, she said, oppressed women, I, women, and especially women workers, because they don't have certainty under the state or fascism, no tranquility, no sustenance, no life in this valley of irresponsible, vain, and cowardly people. That's who she thinks were politicians. Nothing protects us, no the laws of the state, no the unconditional brotherhood of the workers of the world. She's talking about the feminist perspective. The state calls us out laws and the unwise, I think she means men, uh, look at us with pity because uh, we don't want to dig into the mess of social pestilence. And here she refers both to the state and to the feminist perspective. Um, before I read her uh, obituary, I want to conclude by saying that um, I was just sharing a glimpse of her voice. I did not much uh, of historical um, um, context, but because I think it's important to rediscover their voices and how they were um, able to implement revolutionary strategies like occupying the spaces, occupying the centers, occupying you know, theater and cultural practices, especially with the print press that allow them to uh, connect with each other and recruit and make calls uh, of action. They fought elitism because this would not have been printed in any other periodical, so they created their own periodicals. And their situation were very scare conditions. So in very sheer scare conditions, there were cigar rollers, they were able to do this. They were developed affiliated associ associations, so they work alongside socialists and progressives when they had an objective in mind. And they would did a lot of protest and solidar solidarity. Today, I can do that in the answers if possible, but there was a, a lot of solidarity that they did and helped and avoided thousands of deportations. So this was the backbone, backbone that hold the workers together. It was action that hold them together. Obviously, there is a lot of ideology written, but it's ideology written that is uh, meant to mm, lead them to action. So you can see we are recovering a lot of these women. I'm finishing right now, just two or three minutes. Um, um, we're recovering lots of them. Sonia has recovered them. 
We know other scholars are recovering them, so we'll see more and more, and hopefully we'll see how they communicate it among them. But a lot has been a lot has been lost. There is obviously a sisterhood. The way she talks about men, there is obviously there was a sort of sisterhood there that women talk about these issues and the tyranny of patriarchy, the state, and fascism. And it's evident the way uh, agents of change. And they went beyond the domestic sphere, sometimes playing with what was expected to, of them as mothers, but they went beyond because they were secretaries, they were delegates, they were editors of these periodicals, they were board of these periodicals. And in her obituary, written by men, because Espana Libre was mainly written by men, although it was very hard to find things about Michaela, that's what they talk about her. So I think it was a nice, nice, Obituary. She says she was a teacher, a writer, known for her work, contributor in many periodicals of the Americas. She dedicated years to the victims of repression as secretary of the Committee Pro Prisoners. They're talking about España Libre. Violeta was a brilliant speaker. She gave many conferences in these centers and an intelligent warrior for the freedom and rights of women. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monse. It's really great. Um, it's really great to hear from from both you and Sonia, and to hear these these amazing stories. Um, you know, I really enjoyed it, and I look forward to the chance to uh, discuss it more and discuss it with the audience um, after my own presentation here. So, I guess I'm going to introduce myself, which is always awkward. Um, but I'm, my name is Spencer Beswick. He, him pronouns. Um, I'm a PhD candidate. Um, I'm writing my dissertation on the history of anarchism in the late 20th century, particularly in the United States, um, with a focus on love and rage. Um, and I'm really interested in the development of a revolutionary intersectional anarchism. Um, uh, uh, Monse, you're, you're still sharing your screen. Oh, sorry. Uh, my you're good. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. <laughs> No worries at all. Um, in addition to my, my dissertation work, I also want to plug that I'm part of an anarchist oral history project where we're trying to interview as many people as we can who have been involved with anarchist projects and organizations, etc. Um, since the 1960s or so. Um, so with that said, if you were involved with any of the things that I'm about to talk about, um, I would love to talk to you, right? Especially if you listen to what I have to say and you're like, wow, Spencer's full of shit and he's totally wrong about everything. Tell me that. I want to interview you and learn why I'm wrong about everything and then you can set me straight. Um, so at the end of this presentation, I will drop a link in the chat about that. Okay, let me start my own timer so that I can uh, and share my screen. All right. Um, great. So my, my presentation today is called We're Pro-Choice and We Riot, Anarcho-Feminism in Love and Rage. So we're skipping ahead to the end of the 20th century to talk about how anarchist feminism developed since the time periods that Sonia and Monse were talking about. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to briefly discuss the history of anarcho-feminism in the US in the 1970s and 80s to just kind of frame the history that I'm talking about and then dive into how anarcho-feminists in love and rage further developed these anarcho-feminist politics and helped to formulate a theory and practice of a revolutionary intersectional anarchism. Um, that I think is, you know, still with us today. So just some brief notes on anarcho-feminism in the 1970s and 80s. Um, so although anarchists had long supported gender equality and sexual liberation, um, sometimes more in theory than practice, um, anarcho-feminism as a coherent body of theory and practice was really first developed as an explicit political tendency within the women's liberation movement of the 1970s. Um, so there's a lot to say about that, um, but I won't say it because I don't have time. So I'd really recommend checking out 
this excellent uh, issue of Perspectives on Anarchist Theory put out by the Institute for Anarchist Studies on Anarcho-Feminisms. It has a great article on anarcho-feminism in the 1970s by Julia Tenenbaum. Um, shout out to that. Um, but in part, this new formulation of anarcho-feminism meant a, you know, started with a rediscovery of Emma Goldman, who Monseo was just talking about, right, but also um, moving beyond her in certain ways. So anarcho-feminism in the women's liberation movement, um, I'll say a word on its theory and on its practice, right? So theoretically, it's bringing together the anarchist tradition, um, critique of all forms of hierarchy, critique of the state and capitalism, commitment to, you know, working class revolution um, and to the possibility of a better, you know, liberated socialist world, um, combined with a feminist theory and critique of patriarchy and critique of how different forms of hierarchy uh, fit together, um, interlock together in a vision of um, struggle against this, right? So anarchism and feminism really came together theoretically um, with this critique of all forms of hierarchy and the struggle against it. And then in practice, um, uh, Lynn Farrow said that feminism practices what anarchism preaches. Right, so a lot of anarcho feminists made the argument in the 1970s that the women's liberation movement was actually structurally anarchist, right, that it was shaped by non hierarchical organizations, consensus based decision making, struggle against all forms of hierarchy and oppression, and that it attempted to prefigure a new world and to build the radical infrastructure for that world. Um, that's all that I'll say on anarcho-feminism in the 1970s. Um, what comes next? Uh, uh, Far-right counter-revolution, right? Uh, which is really expressed when Reagan comes to office, but starts before that. Um, there's a right-wing attack on all of the social movements of the 60s and 70s, and in this case, an attack on feminism and on women more broadly. Um, this was, was perhaps most clear in the realm of abortion, right? And attempts to roll back the gains of uh, women's bodily autonomy. Uh, mainstream feminism um, generally becomes more liberal, more tied to the Democratic Party, uh, more professionalized, um, and anarcho-feminism continues to exist um, mostly within other movements. So within the anti-nuclear movement, within the anti-war movement, Central American solidarity, etc. cetera. Um, but in the 1980s, in the midst of counter-revolution, um, and the fracturing of the left and of the movements of the 60s, um, anarchism actually goes through a process of revitalization um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but there was a, a series of continental anarchist gatherings in the late 1980s that you know, sort of built a coordinated movement out of the continental anarchist milieu. Um, and out of this comes, one, one thing that comes out of this is Love and Rage. So Love and Rage was first a newspaper and then a network of local anarchist organizations. And then in 1993 becomes a more structured federation, becomes the Love and Rage Revolutionary Anarchist Federation. And it was one of the most important anarchist groups in the late 20th century. It existed from 1989 to 1998. Um, since Sonia was talking about Mexico, it um, I should mention that Love and Rage had a chapter in Mexico City called Amor y Rabia, um, who after the Zapatista uprising in 1994, um, were very involved in Zapatista support, um, interviewed leading Zapatistas, including Subcomandante Marcos, and then Love and Rage printed these interviews in its newspaper. And this was one of the main um, uh, conduits of information coming out of Chiapas in the 1990s. Anyway, but for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about anarcho-feminism in Love and Rage. Um, and I'm going to give five examples of anarcho-feminist political work to think about the different forms in which this struggle took place and how they fit together. So first, I'm going to talk about the reproductive freedom struggle, um, which is where I'll spend uh, the majority of the time, perhaps, but also queer and trans liberation, debates around pornography, um, student struggles in the CUNY City, City University of New York system, um, including the Welfare Action Committee at Brooklyn College, and then end by talking about the struggle against anarchist patriarchy within Love and Rage. 
And I'll end with a few words on thinking about revolutionary intersectional anarcho-feminism and what we can learn from Love and Rage. So first, um, talking about reproductive freedom, part one of this, um, thinking about building autonomy from below. So a lot of the feminist movements in the 1980s, a lot of mainstream feminism um, in response to this counter-revolutionary backlash, there was a lot of emphasis on trying to preserve some, just preserve and defend the gains that the feminist movements had made. Um, and there was a lot of focus on defending Roe v. Wade, on fighting for the Equal Rights Amendments, generally on uh, winning legal rights, preserving legal equality. Um, and anarchists rejected this entire realm of struggle, right? And rather focused on building bodily autonomy from below and building the feminist movement from below um, against the control of the state, capitalism, and patriarchy. Um, as well as the medical industry in particular, when we're thinking about abortion. Um, so there's this really great um, anonymous article in the Love and Rage newspaper on the history of women's health um, called Laws and Outlaws, um, where the authors argue that, quote, the medical industry is motivated by profits and, like all institutions, is founded on social inequalities, racism, sexism, homophobia. Medicine is something we must take into our own hands. Because how can you smash the states if you're still walking funny from a visit to the gynecologist? Um, really great quote. So, so how do you build autonomy outside of this medical system, outside of patriarchy, um, the state, and capitalism? Um, women in love and rage fight to develop women's health infrastructure. Um, one example of this was in San Francisco. Um, they developed um, women's self-help groups. Um, where uh, one participant describes that women learn the basics of self-cervical exams, do pelvics on each other, and learn how to do menstrual extraction. She goes on to say that being in a self-help group has had a very strong effect on my relationship to my own body, as well as my understanding of women's bodies in general. Women who go through this process together develop a very strong bond. We are truly taking control of our own bodies. Right, so this is the foundation of the anarcho-feminist approach to reproductive freedom and to thinking about abortion is framing it within the terms of establishing individual and collective bodily autonomy and figuring out how to build the structures that enable women to, um, to know and to care for their own bodies, including being able to provide abortion, um, whether or not the state says that it was legal. Um, in 1993, um, Women in Love and Rage went on a women's health tour trying to spread this analysis and build these self-help groups around the United States. Um, obviously, this is not new, right? The women's liberation movement in the 1970s established you know, women's health clinics, other forms of women's infrastructure, but Love and Rage really drew out the, the anarchist core of this, right? Of, of building autonomy, rejecting um, a dependence on the legal system, on the state, et cetera, and to instead build um, freedom and autonomy from below. The other side of this is that they were very involved in um, defensive abortion clinics. Um, so in the late 1980s, this far-right um, anti-abortion group called Operation Rescue really went on the attack against abortion clinics. Um, they would picket them. They some of you know they were connected with people who would firebomb them and you know assassinate um, abortion providers. Um, but Operation Rescue attempted to host so 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 um, Love and Rage women were very involved in Love and Rage in general with clinic defense against Operation Rescue. This really came to a head in Minneapolis in 1993 when Operation Rescue tried to host a major summer training camp um, in Minneapolis. And anarchists in Minneapolis were like, you know what? fuck that, they can't come to Minneapolis. Um, the anarcho-punk uh, zine collective Profane Existence kind of set the tone for the local response um, when they put up this poster all around town um, and vowed that, you know, Operation Rescue, if you come to our town, we'll lock you in a church and burn the fucker down. Things did not go quite that far, but anarchists physically confronted Operation Rescue, blocked them in their church, disrupted their meetings, vandalized their materials, um, protected clinics from their attacks and generally made them very unwelcome, right? So instead of just a defense of clinics, it was going on the attack, 
um, to take the fight to the far right in the streets. Um, and they, they were very successful and essentially ran Operation Rescue out of town. Um, so it's useful to think uh, of Love and Rage's approach to reproductive freedom as a, strat a revolutionary dual power strategy um, of, on the one hand, building autonomous women's infrastructure from the bottom up, a feminist dual power that provides alternatives to the state's patriarchal power structure, um, and then on the other hand, also going on the attack against the structures of the status quo. Um, so disruptive action challenging patriarchal state power combined with the establishment of autonomous women's infrastructure were the building blocks of a revolutionary feminist movement. So next, uh, Lovenridge was very committed to queer and trans liberation. Um, there were a lot of queer anarchists in Love and Rage, and they helped to bring militant anarchist theory and tactics into the broader queer liberation movement. So for instance, Love and Rage um, brought a militant edge to a 1990 rally in New York commemorating the Stonewall Uprising. Um, they came as a block, uh, dressed in black block, and they brought a banner to the rally um, that provided direction for an otherwise pretty unorganized crowd um, who didn't have a plan for, for marching. Um, one participant describes how, quote, what had been an unorganized mass of people outside a bar turned into a spirited march behind a queer without fear autonomous anarchist action banner. All right, so this exemplifies how love and rage encourage broader movements to take a more radical confrontational approach. They would also show up to, you know, uh, generally more mainstream feminist marches and anti-war marches, right? And it was not necessarily about convincing people to become anarchists or to join the organization, but rather of spreading new tactics and values that had been developed within the anarchist movement of the 1980s. So things like black bloc tactics coming out of European autonomous movements, um, militant anti-fascism and street fighting tactics coming out of anti-racist action. Love and Rage also marched in a block at the 1993 Queer March on Washington, which this uh, photo is of, um, chanting things like, we're here, we're queer, and we hate the government. Um, there's a group of anti-racist skinheads who marched chanting, oi, 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 we fuck boys, um, which is a great chant. Um, besides queer, participating in queer activism, um, anarcho feminists argued that there was something inherently queer about the anarchist rejection of all structures of social domination and a practice of a non hierarchical, fluid approach to the world. Um, this perspective prefigured later developments in queer anarchist theory. Um, I would encourage folks to read the uh, Mary Nardini gang um, uh, in, toward the queerest insurrection, where they talk about queerness and social war. Uh, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go into it. Um, Love and Rage was also involved with AIDS activism with ACT UP. They articulated an anarchist critique of ACT UP's focus on the state. Um, again, for the interest of time, I'm not going to go, going to go into it. Um, but connected with uh, a commitment to queer liberation was also a commitment to trans liberation. And so Love and Rage promoted trans liberation as part of a broader commitment to revolutionary anarcho-feminism, a commitment to autonomy, a commitment to freedom. And this was particularly meaningful in the time in the context of a broader trans exclusionary radical feminism, which obviously we're still dealing with today as well. Um, but Love and Rage saw trans liberation as a necessary part of a broader sexual and gender revolution. Um, and there were trans members of Love and Rage, it was a very accepted thing, but that said, it was not a focus or a major area of political work, um, and in some ways this was reflective of the time period, um, but at the same time, other revolutionary organizations at the time, including the Workers' World Party, made trans liberation more of a priority, um, so it seems clear that more could have been done by Love and Rage. Um, Okay, for the interest of time, I think that the, the porn component that I was going to talk about is maybe the least interesting part here. Um, if folks are interested in hearing more about it, you can ask about it. Um, but I think that, you know, the anarchist contribution to the pornography debates in the feminist movement was mainly to decenter the role of the state in the debates and frame things more around building um, autonomy and self-defense and equality from below, including the possibility of creating what they called new porn. Um, consensual, the porn that would model consensual liberated sex. Um, uh, Love and Rage was also very involved in New York in student struggles um, in the city university. Um, 
this was in the context of a wave of austerity measures that targeted the city university um, in large part because it was predominantly working class, predominantly people of color, lots of immigrants, and that it was the center of a center of radical theory and practice and organization in New York. Um, the state did not like this and so tried to target um, the, the, the university system for budget cuts. Um, so Lovenrage was very active in the radical student movement to defend CUNY. Um, one thing in particular connecting it to anarcho-feminism um, was that one of the austerity measures was trying to transform welfare into workfare, right? So there was a number of uh, women who were single mothers who were on welfare, who were going to CUNY, right, um, and living off of the welfare. Um, and so there was an attempt to, to, you know, make them work instead, right? So there was a whole number of mothers who had to, were mainly women of color, um, poor, who had to drop out of college in order to work, um, uh, you know, minimum wage jobs. Um, and so Love and Rage was very involved with uh, what became the Welfare Action Committee at Brooklyn College, which struggled against this. Um, and uh, they, you know, organized with young moms to fight for welfare and fight for the right to education against austerity. Um, and I think this is, you know, uh, an example of intersectional politics and practice, right? Where anarcho-feminism doesn't just mean a commitment to only organizing with other people who identify as anarcho-feminists, but rather an analysis of the situation, an analysis of how oppression hierarchy functions and a commitment to struggles against all forms of interlocking hierarchy and oppression. So the last thing, combating anarchist patriarchy. So despite Levin Rage's you know, formal commitments um, to feminism and the struggle against patriarchy, there's still sort of an everyday patriarchy and everyday male dominance in Love and Rage, both interpersonally and structurally, right? Most of the leaders were charismatic, middle-class white men, even though a lot of the work was carried out by women, right? Uh, a classic story. Um, and so feminists called for both structural and interpersonal changes, right? And they critiqued men who wanted to make it all personal and say, oh, I'm, I'm working on my sexism, so that's, that's enough. They said, no, the problem is both interpersonal. It is, uh, we want you to work on your sexism, but the problem is also structural. And therefore the solution must also be structural, right? So women fought to um, form women's caucuses and form other ways of structurally creating power for women um, within the organization. Um, this was never totally adequately addressed. And I think that this is a lesson for us to take forward today, right, of what commitments um, to feminism and to fighting against patriarchy mean in our own anarchist organizations. That's not enough to just have individual commitments um, to fighting against sexism, but rather we must think structurally of how to um, you know, build, um, uh, build power within organizations and change structures and decision-making processes. So I'll wrap up by saying, you know, how does this all fit together? Um, intersectionality, as we know, doesn't mean just the listing of multiple forms of oppression or multiple identities that all add up, but rather analyzing how they all work together to produce specificity and, and to produce an overall system of hierarchy and oppression. As Laura Lib put it in the Love and Rage newspaper in an article, there was an introduction to anarcho-feminism. She said, through feminism, we gained an understanding of one system of domination, patriarchy, and it's working through public, the states, and private capitalism, social institutions. From this, we developed a recognition of the interlacing of all forms of domination and a realization that an end to patriarchy meant an end to all power relations. And so then, in you know, Love and Rage was trying to work out in practice what this could mean. And I think that we have a lot of lessons that we can learn from them, both positive and negative. I think it's really useful to learn from historical examples like this uh, to have models of anarcho-feminist praxis. So I'll end there. Remember, again, if you were involved with any of this or if you totally disagree with my analysis, I want to talk to you for the Anarchist Oral History Project. And I will drop a link in the chat. Let me end my screen share. Um, whew, all right. Let me take a sip of water here before we uh, 
So it looks like we have about 20 minutes. Um, we'd love to open the floor to comments or questions from the audience, whether you want to type something in the chat or um, just you know raise your hand or unmute yourself and jump in. Um, I know we just threw a lot at you, um, but it would be great to, to open up discussion. As, as uh, audience members sort of think about their questions, let me just say thank you, Monsa and Spencer. Um, that those were two great presentations. Spencer, I think that uh, you remind us of the long legacy of, of anarchism and anarchist ideas, um, that even though these forms of expressions were brutally repressed, in some cases, you know, people actually lost their lives. Uh, or their witnessed uh, loved ones being, um, you know, tortured uh, and jailed or eliminated. Um, you remind us of the power of ideas um, and how those ideas have the, you know, can can affect real change uh, in many people's lives. So thank you for reminding us of that. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, much appreciated. Um, all right, we have a question from the audience. We'd love to hear a little more about the porn piece of your talk to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I can say a few words about that. Um, so there was, in the 1980s, this was really the time of the porn wars in the feminist movement, right? So you have people like Andrea Dworkin who are really critiquing porn as not just being, um, you know, violent and oppressive to women in terms of the, the porn itself, but also sort of um, a key component of a broader system of misogyny and of violence against women, right? That it promoted this system, um, that it hurt the women who were involved, that it hurt sex workers. Um, and she pushed and people um, organizing with her pushed for, you know, uh, government bans on pornography under obscenity laws. Um, and uh, on the other hand, you had you know, people who were not necessarily pro-porn, although some people, you know, this is, um, or, you know, some of sex positive feminism comes out of, but saying, you know, this is way too much of a blanket statement of what porn is, um, it, and it could be possible to make porn differently, right, that would um, um, organize alongside sex workers to fight for better working conditions, right, organize to fight for, like, workers' cooperatives, um, have other models of pornography that are less patriarchal and less male driven. Um, also queer pornography, which is, um, you know, often very different from a very, you know, heterosexist focus on pornography. Um, and so these debates took place within Love and Rage, but kind of decentering the state and all of it, right? So even the anti-porn people in Love and Rage didn't want the state to ban pornography, didn't want the state to take action, thought that this would just be counterproductive to ask the state to do this, and that it would probably actually end up hurting sex workers the most. Um, and so they, they wanted to take action, you know, outside of the realm of the state, you know. I mean, in Canada, the um, direct action movement, you know, firebombs, porn stores, right? Nobody was doing that in the United States. Um, but then the anarchists in Love and Rage who were more pro-porn, um, you know, made some of these similar arguments about the possible uh, liberatory, um, often queer, uh, feminist porn, um, and that the answer wasn't just to um, reject all forms of porn, but to, you know, again, organize alongside sex workers um, and to maybe create um, what they called new porn um, that could model, and, and, and that this was kind of part and parcel of the anarchist project, right, of, of critiquing harms that they saw and then also presenting an alternative. Um, I do have a, a, a question to, to ask for, for Sonia and Monse. You both um, uh, mentions the concept of revolutionary motherhood in your talks um, and, you know, how women mobilize this for specific aims. And I was really struck by how, you know, for the people I'm talking about in Love and Rage, nobody's talking about revolutionary motherhood, right? This is very different. Maybe it's just different historical periods. Um, but I would be curious to hear more about some of 
you know, how this worked and maybe some of the tensions um, uh, between, you know, gender roles and an anarchist critique. Um, would love to hear more about that. Um, sorry, it's kind of difficult to see, to know if you're about to say something, Monse. Um, no, no, that's uh, fine. <laughs> uh, no, thank you for that question, Spencer. I mean, as early as um, the, the, the last decades of the 19th century, at least for um, the region that I'm interested in, uh, for, for Northeastern Mexico, um, there is a discourse on uh, motherhood circulating um, from um, coming from um, from state agents, coming from um, community residents, sort of coming from different places. Um, however, um, it's um, it's it's not until um, women like Reinaldo Gonzalez Parra and others that are sort of grounded in like, you know, in, in uh, anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist um, uh, collectives that began to um, talk about motherhood from a slightly different perspective, um, which is uh, um, promoting sort of even anti-clerical ideas um, and, um, and, and, and it's, it's a discourse against patriarchy also. So they began to talk about a motherhood or how women should embrace their status as mothers, particularly madres obreras, particularly working mothers, and to use that as, as, as a way to um, uh, instruct their children uh, in with sort of with eyes eyed open. Uh, not to fall for, you know, the falsities, as they put it, of the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church um, was quite strong, still very strong in places like Mexico. Um, and so they begin to talk about a motherhood that serves the interests of the community, not the interests of the state. Um, and by, you know, by the end of the Mexican Revolution, I mean, this is one way that the revolutionary government um, uh, or, you know, one, one way it seeks to incorporate women into this larger discussion of like citizenry, citizenry, promoting Mexican nationalism, and also to avoid another massive civil war. And so um, you have, you know, propaganda from the revolutionary government talking about, you know, madres revolucionarias, right? But it's all sort of, um, uh, to serve the, the greater purpose of forming a stronger Mexico, a stronger revolutionary government. There's all there's always this talk about. Let's remember, you know, uh, those who um, who fought, you know, uh, for revolutionary ideals and who lost their lives. But they're talking about a very different revolution. For a lot of these anarcho feminists, revolutionary the real revolutionary never came. The real revolution that they envisioned never really came because it was co-opted by so-called revolutionaries who wanted to sort of pick and choose who, who was sort of um, acting in, in, a, um, uh, in a particular way that served the, the greater interests of the state. So going back to your question about gender roles, right? So there's a gender, there's a gender sort of normative um, discourse that emerges coming on the part of the state, coming also on the part of, of socialists that are tied to the uh, rising major political party. And they're also talking about, hey, workers need this, you know, we need to, you know, worker autonomy, but they're doing it through um, the discourse of, of a state sanctioned socialism that also begins to use women to sort of um, like to incorporate them into mainstream society. Uh, but they're talking about a very different type of, of, of woman ideal, a very type of motherhood ideal. These anarcho-feminists, I mean, they're, they're, they're even uh, encouraging their, their comrades or female comrades uh, and male comrades to not baptize their children. Um, you know, they talk about, you know, la madre anarquía, right? It's the, you know, the anarchism is sort of like the real mother. And so there's also sort of this kind of, you know, it's it's using gender language, but in a in a in a sort of radical revolutionary um, uh, manner. Um, and so there are different discourses. I think it's important to point out that there are different sort of 
visions of motherhood, at least in Mexico at this time, and certainly along the US-Mexican border. Um, that um, uh, at first, I mean, I was pretty naive when I first approached this topic like six years ago, and I was like, oh, they are echoing the state discourse of, of motherhood. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of dug deeper um, and looking at anarchist writings and, and other, other forms of, you know, other primary sources that I was like, oh, wait, this is a very different revolutionary motherhood that they are, that they are promoting. So very, very, I mean, it's still very prominent in Mexico used by con the conservative political party of the PAN, the Partido Acción Nacional, that sort of, you know, represents the Catholic Church. And they're talking about, you know, the civic duties that mothers have, right, to the state. Uh, but you also see it from like AMLOS, the current president, his political party, the Morena, the Partido del Movimiento Regeneración Nacional, uh, you know, in, in a, um, a, a bit more uh, progressive manner, but also still serving the interests of the political party, right? So I think it's uh, it's it's a fascinating topic, but I think one that has to be approached in a very careful manner um, because they are there are there are clear differences. Thank you for that question. Yeah, I I think Sonia, I would like to add because I think Sonia was very right in saying that it really depends because it's very complex. But in my own research, I found what Sonia was saying that um, women. We're doing, as you said, Spencer, their own, their own groups, right? And they talked about topics that were expected for them to talk about, like, you know, saving children, you know, motherhood, um, doing fundraisers, but it was a, an entry door to be able to do what they wanted to do. It, these were very patriarchal societies that were, they were dealing with. Other researchers like anarchist uh, exiles in France have also found that I cannot, I was looking for the name, but I will email it to you, Spencer. She, she has also written about how it was used as a way to enter and do their activism. And it was also used as motherhood. But as, as Sonia was saying, I found very radical other ways of seeing motherhood. For example, Micheli talks the same way as Capetillo, that is a very well-known anarcho-feminist, that marriage is, is, is a selling out. It's just women being sold as, it's like prostitution because you get married to a, a man so that you do all the labor for the man, right? So, and the sex labor and the domestic labor. So both Micheli and Capetillo, so that's why it's so sad that the archives have been lost because you don't know who was reading who or who was writing to who, but uh, they talk, both of them, Capetillo and, and Micheli talk about marriage as, as something that goes against women because basically you become the slave, you lose property, you lose your rights and they were against it. Also, I wrote an article that I will send it to you, Spencer. This is a communist that was in exile in Spain. A lot of people were in Spain in exile, meaning they weren't able to escape Franco, but they were hiding in, in Spain or, you know, pretending. So she has this article and it's very um, funny or very interesting to see how her poetry has been interpreted as this duality, right? As Sonia was saying, right? This motherhood of taking care of the children, of taking care of who need, of, of, of providing food, providing clothes. And if you look at all the literary research that, because I do more cultural studies than history, right? So it's been interpreted like this mother. And I read an article saying, no, 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 no. She's much more radical than that. She, that's how she wrote these levels on the poet, on the poem, because she knows that's the only way she could be published, right, in Franco Spain. But when you read between the lines, it's a motelluric motherhood, it's a motherhood that gives birth, it's a motherhood that you see her giving birth. So you give her, like the blood gets into the earth and the earth belongs to his son. So if you read between the lines, she's saying, we the workers, are the ones who produced more workers and the land is ours. So if you, if you read between the lines, it's a much more radical motherhood. But I think sometimes these women were playing with these different, different nouns that they know. I mean, there is a lot of censorship and 
not only women, men were using words that they knew would get published because censor readers, not only in dictatorship, but also, you know, in elitist newspapers, you know, in uh, uh, democracy are also very busy. So sometimes they just read, you know, and they know, oh, it's about taking care of children. Yes, whatever. Oh, it's about cooking, whatever. But then you read deeper and it's a double meaning. So I will send you the article, maybe it's helpful. Yeah, that would be great, thank you. Um, and we just have a couple minutes left here. So I, I was I was thinking um, as you both um, were talking about revolutionary motherhood and, and my kind of off the cuff comments of, of like, oh, well, the people I'm talking about were never framing things that way. And then kind of reflecting on, you know, the very different historical and cultural context um, that love and rage was in, right? And thinking about, you know, why was this not more present? Um, you know, it was a lot of young punks, right? <laughs> Very different subcultural norms, um, but also the, you know, some problems in the anarchist movements and the left, right, of not supporting families, of not providing childcare for meetings, right, of things like this that kind of push out um, people who have kids rather than supporting them and keeping them within the movement. Um, which, you know, th thinking about our own organizing today um, and how to, you know, do that better. Um, and Spencer, I'm thinking very quick, another very important thing that anarcho, uh, anarcho feminists did, it was the free love, that men thought that free love was just, you know, and she said, no, no, and how she con they contested free love on, on the 30s and on the 40s, like, so that's another important um, aspect of this uh, radical motherhood. Yeah, and if I may just quickly, um, I, you know, some of these anarchists and anarcho syndicalist organizations that I looked at, I mean, they're highly gendered, right? I mean, the, you know, the, the, the CGT, the Confederación General de Trabajadores, which was the main, by 1921, the main big umbrella organization and these smaller sort of anarchist collectives are affiliated to, to, to it. Um, I mean, they critique um, the, uh, some of the um, uh, communist collectives that had um, supported um, uh, uh, certain political parties because the anarchists believe like, hey, you know, if you once you support a political party, you become a pawn of the state, right? So avoid that. But they use like um, the image of the prostitute to compare uh, their communist colleagues. Um, and so there's a gender language there too. So I think that's important to point out that, you know, a, a lot of these folks um, who had very progressive ideas um, also um, promoted some of the gender norms of the period. I think that's a good place to end. We're at time. Um, thank you again so much, Sonia and Manse. This was really great to do this panel with you. And thank you, everybody, for coming out for it. Um, appreciate it. And uh, see you in the streets. Thank, thank you, you very so much, much, everybody. Thank you everybody for coming. Reach us, reach out to us if you want to. Thank you.